Yeah, uh, now I see it. Okay. Hey, Johnny Jet. This is my 39 travel questions. And today we have Peter Greenberg, who is the travel guru. I used to go see Peter speak at travel conferences when I first got started in travel. And Peter has been kind enough to always uh, lend his time to teach me the ropes. I've flown with him. Actually, last year, we just randomly were sitting next together on a plane from L.A. to Vegas. <laughs> and Peter, how many miles have you flown? Uh, 23 million. I mean, you are literally one of the world's most traveled people. I mean. Well, not for the past seven weeks. <laughs> that's for sure. No, no, no. Now what I've done is I've created a special passport for myself. And I stamp it every time I go from the bedroom to the living room. It makes me feel better. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah. So Peter, you know, Peter's had shows on the Travel Channel. He has one on, you still have one on PBS. I have a couple on PBS, yeah. Which ones? You have Royal Tour? Yeah, the Royal Tour with Heads of State. We have The Travel Detective. We have a whole new series starting in the fall called Hidden, where I take you to a country and tell you everything that's not in the brochure or the guidebooks. Uh, Another title for that would be No Gift Shop. If it has a gift shop, we're not going there. And how, how can people find you? Easy. Uh, my website has the most imaginative name. It's petergreenberg.com. My YouTube channel is also Peter Greenberg. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. And, of course, the radio show. Uh, the radio show has been on the air now for 20 years. It's on CBS. It's called Eye on Travel. And if for any reason you can't find it in your neighborhood, that's easy. Just go to our website hit the radio icon, and we're broadcasting, streaming, uh, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. every Saturday. All right, well, subscribe to Peter's newsletter, his YouTube channel. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Like this video because it helps with the algorithm. And, Peter, I'm going to give you a rapid fire. So, where'd you grow up? I grew up, believe it or not, in the very place I'm talking to you now. I've been in this building in New York City since I'm six months old, the exact same building in that's Manhattan, Upper East Side. Awesome. Yeah. And, and that's where you live too, right? Well, that's right. Well, actually, I live in about four places. I live here. I live in Los Angeles, as you know. Uh, I live in uh, Long Island and I live on Fire Island. So, uh, that, I'm, four places that I'm usually back and forth. And you used to have Bangkok. I used to have Bangkok with my good friend Rudy Maxa. We had it for 25 years and, uh, just sold it about a year and a half ago. Okay. All right. Well, tell me your earliest travel memory. My earliest travel memory, you want the one that I actually remember or the one that was told to me? I'll take both. Okay. My earliest travel memory as it was told to me was when I was six months old. I flew with my parents from New York to Los Angeles on an American Airlines DC-6. And when I got off the plane, actually, when I was still on the plane, the flight attendants, otherwise known as stewardesses then, and the pilot presented me with a, with a beautiful certificate that they all signed, which I still have in its frame. I was the first member of the American Airlines Sky Cradle Club. <laughs> and you know what the benefits of that are? I'd love to hear it. Nothing. But it was fun. I, have, I haven't hung up. Uh, but my first real travel memory, other than counting you know, fins of 57 Chevys on road trips with my parents uh, was my first trip at the age of 12 to Europe with my parents. Uh, that was on a Pan Am 707. And I'll never forget this. I was so excited to be on the plane that as we were circling over Orly in those days, uh, I was so excited I threw up. And uh, that was the first and last time I ever threw up on a plane. But uh, I remembered it. So, by the way, how many countries do you think you've been to? Oh, I know. Uh, it's 151. 151? Yeah. Out of 193? 196 if you add some other ones. But under the UN count, it's 193, yeah. Okay, wow. And all seven continents? Yes. You're the man. Um, do you have a favorite American city? Besides New York. Oh, okay. Besides New York? Well, I lived for 10 years in San Francisco. And I lived in a neighborhood called Noe Valley, best weather in town, um, and uh, in a beautiful 1896 Victorian, which I never should have sold. Um, and I, I love San Francisco then, I love it now. How about internationally? My international cities, well, of course, Bangkok was in there because I had a house there for 25 years. Uh, but 
it used to be London. Now it's now I have a couple actually. I, uh, there's it's Paris. Here. There's Lucerne. Um, there's um, there's Hobart actually in Tasmania. Uh, there is um, uh, Madison. Was oh you said international cities? Right? Yeah, but you went to Madison by the way. You went to yeah, Madison, Wisconsin. I love it. Uh, if I could figure out a way to to live there today, I'd do it. So what did you study by the way at University of Wisconsin? What did you say? What did you study at University of Wisconsin? Uh, basically, anti-war and police. Um, when I was there, we were the most active and violent anti-war campus in America. The National Guard was there for basically two years. Uh, people died there during the demonstrations and during bombings. Um, and I, I followed the Mark Twain philosophy of never letting school interfere with my education. But what I did is I wrote for the school paper. That's how I started, really. But my minor, my major was radio, TV, and film. My minor, which might surprise you, was police science. Because I was covering the police so many times in the demonstrations of the National Guard, I figured, I better learn how they think. And so I did. Wow. I mean, you, you have the best stories, by the way. If you've ever been to dinner with Peter Greenberg, you know that he has the best stories. I mean, you cannot compete with this guy. He just takes over the table and he, I mean, it's incredible the stories you've told. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. That'll be $5. All right. How about which country do you think has the friendliest people in the world? Well, Thailand's right up there. I mean, you know, when you first go to Bangkok, uh, there's an old Groucho Marx line that you may remember called, well, actually the line was, I would never join a club that would have me as a member. And when you first land in Thailand, people were so nice to you that well, you got to figure out, well, they must be waiting for another guy named Greenberg. Why are they being so nice to me? And then you realize there's nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with them. They have perfected the art of, of hospitality and graciousness and style and humanity. Uh, I've never been disappointed there and I never will. I agree. I love Thailand. Um, although I think the friendliest people are the, in Fiji on the outer islands. Oh, Fiji. You're, uh, uh, let me tell you something. I spent so much time in the archipelagos of, of, of Fiji, especially the Lao group, which if you look at the map is not easy to get to. And I, if anybody is ever going to Fiji, I say to them, look, the very first thing you're going to have to do is on Sunday morning, find the nearest Methodist church, won't be difficult to find, and go in there for the service because you're going to hear the most unbelievably beautiful uh, acapella harmonies you've ever heard. And the way they sing is the way they are. And bula. <laughs> Banaka. Um, yeah. How about which country has the meanest immigration officers? Oh, we don't have enough time for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I would say Russia, uh, because they're all looking for a bribe, both coming in and leaving. Well. Um, I would say, um, in the old days, uh, it was, you know, the Iron Curtain satellite countries, you know, the Bulgarias, the Romanias, uh, today, uh, Hungary is not fun. Hungary is not fun. Uh, you know, leadership problems start with the top. And if you see who's running Hungary, then you'll understand the immigration officers. They don't want anybody coming in, you know, um, uh, those are two, uh, sometimes, uh, you might have a problem in some of the Middle Eastern countries, but I really haven't. And my last name is Greenberg, and I've been to all of them. So, uh, you know, that stereotype is not, doesn't sit well with me because I've never had a problem. Well, how about um, which place do you have no desire to go to? Zero. And I'll tell you why. Uh, how many people do we know that they'll always, and they can ask that of you or me, it's because we travel so much. Oh, where'd you just come back from? And you tell them and they go, oh, it's not on my list. Not on your list. Who publishes this list? <laughs> right? I mean, I don't have a list. The only list I have, maybe, are the 42 countries I haven't been to yet. Um, I mean, that's the only list that matters. Um, and I'm not, by the way, I'm not a, 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 in a race to check anything off a list. I may never get to those 42 countries. Uh, but for me, uh, I can find great stories and great beauty, but mostly great stories, and great people anywhere. I can find it in Chernobyl, Calcutta, or Beverly Hills. It doesn't matter. Um, and, you know, and I see all the time when people are trying to set you know, Guinness records and say, I've been to the most countries, 
And I, I look at them and I go, what did you do? Hop off the ship, touch your foot in the sand and get back on the ship? And you, you're gonna tell me you've been there? That's garbage. You gotta really immerse yourself. And, and so if I tell you I've been to 151 countries, I've actually been there for more than 10 seconds. Wow. Uh, which country surprised you the most, by the way? I'm no longer surprised uh, because when you think of, well, I, I'll give you one that did surprise me at one point, obviously not surprised anymore. When I was growing up, I grew up in the middle of the Cold War. Everything that showed me Eastern Europe or the Soviet Union was always in black and white. Uh, everybody looked grainy and angry and mean and oppressed. And that, that was my impression of Poland. And then I got to Poland and I went, oh my God. And, you know, black and white went out the window. Here's living color. And that applies to the people as well. And so from now on, I don't look at the old stereotypes and say that, you know, I'm surprised anymore because I finally realized the process. Right. And you adopt, you adapt to that. And then look, people are people. If I was airdropped today, I mean, how many times have I said to somebody, you know, I think I'm going to go to Iran. Oh, I'm never going to go there. You'll get killed. Or I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go to North Korea. I got news for everybody. I've been to North Korea. And when you show up, you know, the immigration guy might be a little rigid because that's the only thing he knows. But people are people. And you know what? My mother told me this a long time ago. It's more important to be interested than interesting. And I'm interested. And the minute people realize you're interested, you are embraced with the best stories ever, the best storytelling. They, 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 they hug you. I mean, even in the age of social distancing, I'm okay with that. And, and the bottom line is, even if it's a, a figurative hug, the bottom line is people are people and they want the same for their kids as you want for yours. They want to have the same hopes, the same dreams. The only difference is as Americans, given all, all the places we've been to, as Americans, we have a better shot at realizing those dreams. But that doesn't mean they don't have them. In fact, when they do have them and I can help, I do help. And speaking of social distancing, yeah. how are you doing with the quarantine? Today is May 7th, 2020 huh. and- It is, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm doing okay because there's an old line that I like to use for other situations, I'll use it now. What's the one thing the rat should do if he's ever caught in the trap? You ready? I'm ready. Eat the cheese. <laughs> so I'm eating the cheese. <laughs> and when do you think you'll get on a plane again? Oh, I get on a plane tomorrow. That's not the issue. The issue is people today, because of fear and acting out of an abundance of fear, and I'm not just talking about individuals, I'm talking about cities, states, countries, governments, uh, you know, Fortune 500 uh, corporations. Everybody wants a guarantee. Everybody wants their security blanket. Everybody wants their comfort zone realized. So if you look at the connectivity there, Fortune 500 companies do not want their key employees to travel unless they get a guarantee that they'll be safe or they won't contract the virus. The employees don't want to travel unless they're given a guarantee that they'll be safe. And governments won't even let you in unless they find some sort of a guarantee. And in the absence of widespread testing, or a workable vaccine doesn't exist. So that's one of the reasons why international travel for the next six months is essentially DOA. And the only thing we're gonna have in this country, which is not bad, believe me, is at least we'll be able to rediscover our own country. It'll be US domestic travel. I'm with you. So, but would you jump on a plane right now and come to LA and hang out in your house here? Absolutely. And why haven't you? For one reason, my staff is in LA but they're all working remotely. Nobody's going to the office. So thanks to Zoom, we have our staff meetings two or three times a day. And, and by the way, we're getting a whole lot more done yeah. um, because we never used to have that many meetings. We are just hanging in the office. So there's no point in me coming to LA to have a Zoom meeting with everybody in their own homes. So, but the minute we can actually get back and work in the office, assuming we ever want to go back to the office, then I'll go back out. Well, that's my next question is, you know, with, you know, everyone getting familiar with Zoom. Do you think business travel will change? Do you think people are gonna jump on a plane and hop to Sydney for the day? Not without that vaccine um, and other reassurances. I think we're seeing fundamental change in the way we live, in the way we work and where we work. 
I think the worst business to be in right now would be commercial office real estate. Yep. Um, I think that's, that's finished for a while. Uh, retail is not going to do well. Um, it's not doing well here in New York at all. You know, this week alone, we saw J. Crew and uh, Neiman Marcus file for bankruptcy. There'll be more. Uh, if you walk up Madison Avenue, for, which I do, uh, every fourth store before the pandemic was vacant. Now it's every other store. Wow. That should tell you something uh, where the economy is going. So I think automobile sales are going to drop. Uh, I Look, when you see, uh, you know, people working from home going, this works and I'm just as efficient and I don't have to spend two hours in traffic. Yeah. Um, now, there are exceptions to every rule in a business like mine where, you, you know, you're, you're reporting news. It's a collaborative effort between reporters and writers and researchers and editors and, right, you're going to have to work together. But so far, we've been able to do the editing work this way, but we still have to go out and shoot our stories. Yeah. So certain things aren't going to change, but a lot of things are. The other thing is you're going to see fundamental change in the way people spend their money. Uh, because right now, we're seeing massive credit card defaults. You may not have seen it yet, but it's happening. We saw them in April. We saw them this month. We're going to see them next month. You're going to see a lot of people out there who won't even have the ability to travel because their credit's either been frozen or declined. And how do we pay for travel with credit cards? So the travel industry is going to probably have to come up with a different financial model of letting people pay on the installment plan to get on an airplane. And it may not be through a credit card. That's one thing. Uh, we're going to see four-day work weeks for those people who really do go to an office, not five-day work weeks. Uh, I find it really interesting that right now, uh, a number of automobile manufacturers are offering you 0% APR, six month delayed on your, on your first payment, but that 0% APR is for 84 months. Now let's do the math. How many cars even last for seven years? So the point is there's a desperation out there to try to keep people in their old buying habits, which I don't think is gonna hold up. Yeah. I. I'm one of them. I mean, I wouldn't, there's a, like, crazy low fares right now getting on planes, cruises. I, I just don't have any desire right now. Well, here's the thing. Let's, let's dissect those low fares. In the law of supply and demand, the reason why those fares are low is because the average load factor in terms of number of people on a plane these days is about 17. That's it. And that's the average. There's some planes that have like six people on. So they're not going to be able to discount their way back right? Because if that was true, the planes would be full. The airfare between Fort Lauderdale and LA two weeks ago, round trip was $38. Come on. That was, and most of that was taxes. So they're just flying the planes because they have to under the federal bailout uh, loan guarantee provisions. But when we come out of this, you're not going to see the discounting you're expecting because the fear factor is so strong that low fare, I don't care how low it is, is not going to get over the fear of the unknown virus or the unseen virus, okay? That's number one. So you're gonna see hotels maintain the integrity of their original rates, and you'll see airfares go up dramatically from where they were. They have to go up, they can't go any lower. Right. But here's the, the, the key for everybody watching. The real sweet spot in all this is gonna be in the frequent flyer programs and the frequent stay programs. There's 23 trillion unredeemed miles out there and probably an equal amount of, of hotel stay points. So the hotels will keep their rates high or as high as they were, but to reward the loyalty of their frequent stayers or frequent flyers, they're gonna lower the eligible redemption levels and start burning off all those miles for the people who know who they know are already travelers and just ready to travel again as a way to say, thank you for hanging in there with us. But they're not gonna, I don't, look, on some hotels you'll see deals, but they're not gonna be the traditional deals. They'll be like, you know, stay three nights, get the fourth free at that rate. You, I don't really think you're going to see a lot of discounting. You're going to you're going to see them try, but it's not going to generate revenue and it's not going to generate room nights. And the same thing is going to be in the cruise industry and the same thing is going to be in the airline industry. So the rates are going to stay relatively where they were before the pandemic. The real, you know, the battleground for people who are smart watching now, redeem your miles now for that Thanksgiving or Christmas trip you wanted to do at least within the United States. Yep. And how long do you think airlines can continue to, you know, block the middle seat on like Delta and United? <laughs> well, look, if you're really a social distancing freak, blocking the middle seat accomplishes nothing. Right. It's only about 18 inches uh, on either side of the people sitting here. 
So that's not it. It's a psychological thing. So Delta Airlines right now, and I think America is doing the same thing, saying, if you fly us now, we will not block the, we will not put you in the middle seat. We'll block all the middle seats through the end of June. Well, it's very easy for Delta to say that because nobody's on the plane, right? right? But when we come out of this, their business model is predicated on filling every seat. And for those people who remember three months ago when you were flying, every seat was full. That's how airlines were making a you-know-what amount of money. So the only, the only alternative here is to do a thing where if they do block the middle seat, you, they do that with you knowing that the price of your coach ticket just went up between $80 and $300 per flight. Now, there might be a lot of people on Delta, America, and United who are willing to pay for that privilege. I get that. But what happens to the low-cost carriers, the Spirits, the Frontiers, the Allegiance, even the Southwests, whose business model is predicated on every single seat being full? How do they compete? The answer is they don't, because they can't compete on fare at that point, and they, can't, they never competed on great service in terms of other than Southwest, because you know exactly what you're getting at Southwest, and nobody's ever disappointed by it. But there are other airlines whose motto is, we're not happy until you're not happy, and now you're really not going to be happy because you don't want to pay a fare that's exactly equal to what you would be paying on one of the three, uh, three major legacy carriers. Gotcha. And speaking of airfare and airlines, yeah. you know, do you have a favorite aircraft? Aircraft? The aircraft. My favorite aircraft, uh, I have two, and one of them is no longer flying. One of them is about to be no longer flying. The one of them that's not flying anymore is the old DC-8. I love that plane. It was such a well-built plane by Douglas. It was a, a real beauty plane. And the other plane, of course, which is about to stop flying, is the 747. Uh, every airline now that flies them is starting to retire them. Uh, earlier than usual, by the way, Qantas just retired all of theirs. British Airways just retired all of theirs. Um, you're gonna see some of the foreign carriers like Korean, and um, uh, Cathay retired theirs a long time ago, but, but Korean's gonna retire theirs and they're gonna go away. They're just gonna go away. They've already retired the A340s. They're dumping those uh, prematurely, by the way. And the same thing with the 75s and the 76s at American, uh, the MD88s and the MD90s at Delta. Um, and that leaves only the A380 as the last remaining four engined uh, plane flying in the sky by maybe five months from now, when the last 747s are phased out. Uh, the only 747 then flying in the United States, other than cargo, will be Air Force One. Wow. Um, and then the A380s, which have never been profitable, uh, and they're stopping production on them in about six months in France. Um, a lot of A380s have been retired and taken out of the fleets. Lufthansa is getting rid of theirs. BA very soon with them, Air France very soon with them. Singapore Airlines can't wait to get rid of them fast enough. The only guy still flying them because it's really the bulk of their fleet is Emirates. And they have over a hundred of them. But even Emirates doesn't know what to do with all those planes right now. Not because of the pandemic. They were having that problem before the pandemic. So in one case, they, um, my guess is a lot of those A380s are gonna come back as cargo planes. But that's another story. All right, I'm gonna start giving you my rapid fire questions again. Um, how about, have you set, ever sat next to any celebrities? I know you have. Uh, yes, many, many. Yeah, yeah any stick out? Um, yeah. Who's the most famous person you sat next to? Well, I mean, I've been with lots of presidents, so that doesn't matter, but, but in terms, and on their planes too, which is a real hoot. But uh, oh, everybody from Robert Redford to Jackie Bissett to, uh, I mean, I could go down the list. I mean, it's it's, uh, it's been fun. And mostly on the LA, New York route or? Most, either LA, New York or London to LA. Okay. Now London uh, to LA flights, the old days, uh, British Airways flight 282 and 283 on a Friday, that was the superstar flight. You got on that flight, there were tons of celebrities on that flight and heads of state too. Well, how about, do you have a favorite airport? US airport and international airport. If you're talking major airports in the United States, you gotta go by airports that really were well-designed and work. Uh, Tampa's great, really is a good airport. Uh, Denver's gotten great, even though you gotta drive out there to get there. But as an airport, it works. It didn't used to work, but they fixed it. Uh, I like Salt Lake because even in the winter, those guys are a snow removal guys 
in the worst snowstorms of all, they never close the airport. It operates. I can't understand why other airports haven't figured out what Salt Lake has discovered. Um, obviously, you know, LAX has problems, JFK has problems, O'Hare has problems. Um, uh, Detroit's not bad. Detroit's not bad, actually. I love but, Detroit. Yeah. But if you're looking for smaller airports, I got a lot of them. You know, How about but, internationally? What's your, favorite, what's your favorite international airport? Right now, it's going to be Doha in Qatar. Yep. They have, I mean, you know, you, you, listen, traditionally, if you really want to be honest with yourself, you don't go to an airport. You just want to get through it. You know, you don't go there to have fine dining. You don't go there to entertain your friends. You don't go there to shop. You just want to get out there and get on the plane. That's the only reason why the airport is supposed to be there. It's where you get out, get on, leave, see it. But we all know that's not really the case these days. So if you're going to have an airport that's really going to, to wow you, then it has to deliver on all those other levels. And the one in, in Doha does. I mean, it's an airport that I'll actually go out to, a, to the airport four hours early just to check out the lounge. Yeah, oh my God. that's my next question. What's your favorite lounge, airport lounge? Well, it's Doha for sure. And then the other one that's a very close second is the first class terminal, not just the first class lounge, the first class terminal at, in Frankfurt at Lufthansa. I've been to that one too. Both, yeah. both great. How about, do you have a favorite hotel anywhere in the world? I got a lot of them. Oh my God. I can't I give bet. you one. I really can't give you one. Okay. I uh, can't. Where would you go on your honeymoon then? Well, since I'm already married and did have a honeymoon, um, I, well, listen, I'm, I'm easy. I went on my honeymoon to Fire Island because I didn't want to go to an airport. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to go to an island where I didn't have to fly over a large body of water. And, I could, and I've been on that island since I was six months old as well. Thank you, Mom and Dad. Well, I have a feeling that's your answer for your, my next question. What's your favorite island? Other than Fire Island, I have a lot. I have a lot. Um, you know, you mentioned Fiji. I think Fiji is Tahiti without the attitude. I love it. Um, I love Fiji. I love Tasmania. I love... Um, where else do I, there are a couple of them actually. Um, not so much in the Caribbean, I'm afraid. I mean, I have, I mean, I have a lot of places I really like a lot, but if I'm looking to really chill out. And why is that, by the way, the Caribbean? Crime? No, no. Crime never gets in, in, in the way. I can go to a crime-ridden Fiji and still be happy. Um, um, it's not the crime. It's the infrastructure. It's the energy. Uh, it's... The, the same thing I was talking about in Thailand. It's the, it's the grace and the style. And, uh, you know, the, the smartest thing that the Caribbean islands can do is to send all their staff for training to Thailand. Yeah. They do Which, by the way, in the old days, that's what SAS did. The airline of Scandinavia. They sent everybody to be trained in Thailand, and they sent the Thais to be trained in Scandinavia, and it was a very good idea. How about what's your favorite beach? My favorite, I have a couple. My favorite beach is actually one that most people can't get to right now. Uh, it's, uh, there are a couple. One is Midway Island in the Pacific. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that's halfway between San Francisco and Tokyo. The site of the most decisive naval battle in history. Read up on it, it's unbelievable. The Battle of Midway. It was the site of a top secret U.S. Navy base for 50 years. And in 1997, at the end of the Cold War, and as it was winding down, the U.S. Navy pulled out and gave it over to U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And for a brief period of time, they allowed outsiders to visit, up to 100 at a time on the island. And I got in, um, and wow. And, and the, my definition of a great beach is if you're looking for footprints in the sand, just turn around behind you, because you're the only one who made them. Wow. And that's me. Yeah. All right, let's turn to food for a little bit. What's your favorite restaurant? Huh. Well, I don't go to favorite restaurants. I go to restaurants for favorite individual signature dishes. Okay. Okay. So there's one in Lisbon. There's one in, um, in Venice. There's one. I can give you one in every, in every country just about. What's your favorite food then? Well, no, it's the signature dish at that restaurant. So, for example, in Venice, it's the Tagliolini Gratinata at Harry's Bar right? Cipriani. Um, 
And if you go to Portugal, you go to Lisbon to a place called Pop Sorda, my favorite dish is the dessert. You go to any other restaurant in the world and you order chocolate mousse, it comes in a little petite champagne glass with a little demi tasse spoon, and it's over and before you can say hello. At this restaurant, you order the chocolate mousse, and everybody in Lisbon knows this, who knows this restaurant. You order the chocolate mousse, you're sitting there waiting, and at least for people who are unaware and haven't done it before, all of a sudden you're tapped on the shoulder and you're handed a big dinner plate, empty, and the waiter is holding a bowl like this and a ladle like this and hands it to you. Da da. Yeah. I'm gonna have to go. It's on my. Yeah. It's now on my bucket list. That's it. Um, how about what's the craziest thing you've ever eaten? Well, that wasn't fun. Um, Aboriginal grub out in the middle of the outback. Uh, and half of it was alive. Let's just leave it at that. Ooh, yeah, that, that's a good one. Um, sp speaking of drinking, or I see you drinking. What's your favorite drink of choice while you're while you're flying or oh, or on the ground? Oh, water. Uh, anybody who drinks on a plane is an idiot. Um, the alcohol equivalent of two and a half on the on the air to one on the ground, dehydration, altitude, bad combination. Um, but my favorite drink when I'm on the ground is uh, I'm a big single malt guy uh, and I have a wonderful collection that I've acquired over the years. And there are a number of single malts, mostly from the island of Isla in Scotland. Uh, some of them you can still get, some of them you can't. Uh, and they're, you know, limited production. You need to be sitting and not driving at any time during that, that period of time because just one glass will do you. And you sip it and you just, you think better. One glass. Well, I drink water only on the plane too, so I'm with you. I got about seven more questions for you. Right. How about what's your favorite travel movie? Or any movies gave you um, inspiration? Well, yeah. Um, well, travel was involved in this movie. Most people haven't seen it. I love it. I'll watch it at least once a year. Uh, it was the last Hemingway book that he never really finished. It was finished by his wife after he committed suicide. And that, bo that book is called, which became the movie, uh, Islands in the Stream. Uh, George C. Scott, Claire Bloom, Hart Botner, great cast. Um, another one, uh, again, uh, travel was involved. In fact, there's a great scene at the airport towards the end of the movie. Um, and you're gonna laugh at me because it's, it's a chick flick. <laughs> Love Actually. I love that movie. I love that movie. The airport scene is just, I, I cried. I cried at the airport scene. When I'm they, telling you, when a kid jumped there, oh, it's great. Oh, the best. Yeah. Um, how about travel TV show besides your own? Well, you know what? I loved Anthony Bourdain's show because he was able to do a show that nobody could mess with. You know? And it, there was no committee deciding whether or not certain language was appropriate or certain subjects were appropriate. He just did it. Um, and uh, I really appreciated that. And did you ever meet him? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Um, good guy. I met him a couple times. How about a book, travel book? Well, there's there are two travel books. And luckily, they've now been brought back into print. I recommend them highly. One is a book that was written many, 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 many years ago uh, by Somerset Mom. It's not any book that he's written that you'd remember. It's called The Writer's Notebook. And what it is, it's all his journals or observations dotted down in every place he ever went. And some of them run a paragraph, some of them run six pages. So this is one of those great books that you could open it up to any page and just be immersed. And it's great. Uh, and the second book, which is highly entertaining, is another book written by an author we all know, but people don't, remember, don't realize he wrote this book. It's called Innocence Abroad by Mark Twain. And people don't remember that in the, in the middle of the 18th, 1800s, like the late 1860s, early 1870s, he literally took a steamer to Europe and the Middle East. And at a time when nobody was traveling that way or to those distances or those, those locations. And that book is just amazing. And what's great about that book is his observations then about the travel experience, about the, 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 the ship experience, the hotel experience, the cultural experience are absolutely true today. Wow. Yeah. 
Um, what's the best trip you've ever taken? The one I haven't taken. <laughs> All right. What's your worst travel moment? Oh, I've had a couple. I've, I've been deported. From uh, where? Guatemala. Wow. Uh, not a fun experience. Um, and nine out of, this is a story that's way too long for this, but nine out of the 11 people I interviewed were dead within 48 hours of me interviewing them because I interviewed them. Oh my God. Yeah, not fun. Uh, that was one of the ones that, uh, and then another crazy one was getting out of Khartoum in the middle of a civil war. Um, that was not fun either, but we did it. What's the most embarrassing travel moment? Gosh. Um, On a happier note. Yeah. It, well, if it was happy now, I suppose. Um, well, one of the most embarrassing travel moments happened when I was maybe, I think, eight years old. And I was traveling by train with my dad and my mom, heading, oh, seven years old, seven years old, heading down to Florida from New York. And we were going on the train. My mom was asleep. It was in the morning. And my dad said, let's go to the back observation car because we can see everything, right? And they had announced, this is like nine o'clock in the morning. They had announced that at noon, they were going to separate the trains. One was going to go to Hollywood, Florida. One was going to go to Sarasota. And we were in the front of the train that was going to Hollywood, Florida. So we go down there to the back of the observation car at nine in the morning, thinking we got all the time in the world. And as I'm looking through my little brownie camera, I see a train coming towards us because they're separating the train. They're going to pull it. And I'm going, Dad, they're taking the train. And my mom was asleep, right? Didn't know. We start, this is like a Gene Wilder movie with, you know, with Richard Pryor. We start running through the train and my dad was not a runner. Okay. And we, and we get to, we get to the, to the car that we're supposed to get to the next car. They've already separated it and it's starting to move. And the, and the, and the, and the, uh, and the steward in our car is going, you can do it. Come on. You can do it. And we're running on the tracks. Right. And, and uh, we got on the train at the last second, we actually made it, right? I mean, like, you can't make this up. And we get back to, and my dad looks at me and he goes, do not tell your mother. <laughs> well, I made the mistake of telling my mother and boy, was I grounded. But anyway, that was a somewhat embarrassing moment because like, to this day, what would have happened had we, you know, we never would have been go you know, done, gone. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's so the, your moral, the moral of that story is never pay attention to published schedules. You know, they do separate trains. One time I was in Osaka on the way to the airport yeah. and I'm sitting on the train and this woman tells me I have to get off the train and get to a different car. I'm like, what are you talking about? And I didn't realize that half the car was separating and the front part, I guess, was going to the airport and she saw my bags. And fortunately, yeah. she just dragged me. She didn't speak English. I didn't Good speak See? And, People will uh, help you. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. All right. Two questions left. Yes, sir. Do you have a dream destination? This is going to sound so corny. My dream destination is any destination I've never been to where I can be there with my wife. Okay. Well, and then before I ask you for your best travel tip, tell people again how they can find you. PeterGreenberg.com. PeterGreenberg.com. You can watch me on CBS This Morning or the CBS Evening News or CBS Sunday Morning. The website, I already told you. The YouTube is the same channel, Peter Greenberg. Uh, Instagram. Uh, Twitter, the whole deal. All right. And everyone, please subscribe to this video and like it. All right, Peter, what is your best travel tip? My best travel tip is actually my best life tip. And I use it literally every day. And it's very simple. Never take a no from somebody who's not empowered to give you a yes in the first place. That's a, that's a great tip. Well, Peter Greenberg, not thank you. You're installing a phone or you're trying to go to Australia. You told me this a long time ago, and I always think of it. So thank you. And I think everyone else will, will follow that advice if they don't already. Thank you for taking the time, Peter. Be well. You got it, Johnny. You need, you need a few more planes on your shelf there. <laughs>